You could have been. You could have been, right. And it's also recorded. So good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker of our seminar uh, today, Dr. Michael Schoding, who's an assistant professor in the internal medicine department. Uh, I think I, I give you a more sort of, you know, the way I know Michael's kind of presentation. You hear that these uh, major problems in healthcare are expected to be solved by people who speak two languages. They understand medicine, and at the same time, they're very good at engineering and computational aspect of, of, of the project. And uh, you're going to hear from someone who has this, you know, bilingual ability. Uh, when you see his presentation, you see a lot of math in there. You realize that we're not talking with a regular clinician here or a regular researcher in, in health healthcare. The good thing about uh, Mike is when we started working together, uh, you can send him any mathematical paper, any kind of you know, statistical mathematical paper, and in like you know a few hours, he's asking questions how to improve that. Not only understands the, the foundations, he talks about the improvement. On the quality of his work, I can give you two things. First of all, his K award was, you know, when they scored by NIS, it was 11, the score. And it's not very really something that you always hear, uh, you know, in, in our work. Secondly, I can tell you personally, when we wrote an NSF grant, a very, a very competitive NSF grant proposal together, which we spent a few days on it, not months, just a few days, and Mike was writing most of that. Uh, I can tell you that my expectation was that just like any NSF grant that, you know, like I've been working with NSF for like a couple of decades, it will come, it will get rejected, so I told him it will be rejected. But when we hear that it might be funded, my expectation was that like a hundred different questions will come and say address this, address this. But Mike wrote the grant so well that the first time in history that I worked with, with NSF at least, uh, no comment came back, came back. They just said, do it as you suggested, and it's perfect. So this is the quality of a clinician who understands the computational aspect of that uh, really, really well and goes deep into like sophisticated mathematical aspect to find a solution. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to basically uh, give the floor to Mike, and I want you to uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Schroding for this talk. Thank you, Kayvon. That's very, very kind. So the title of my talk this afternoon is Improving Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome Diagnosis Using mach Novel Machine Learning Approaches. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest related to this presentation. So I want to start this afternoon by telling you guys a story about a patient who was recently hospitalized in the University of Michigan. And I hope in telling you this story, I'm going to give you some framework and a sense of urgency about the problem that we're going to talk about today. So this is a 65-year-old female, and she undergoes spinal surgery for back problems. And after the operation, she's doing OK, but then all of a sudden, she develops really severe breathing problems and has to be put on mechanical ventilation support. And so the, on the left side here is the chest x-ray she uh, gets right after her procedure. And you may or may not have looked at chest x-rays before, but this is fairly normal. There's a heart in the middle. There's lung fields. The lung fields are mostly black, which is normal. There may be a little scattered abnormalities lower, but pretty much normal. But 12 to 24 hours, when she's in really severe distress, she gets this chest x-ray on the right, and it's markedly abnormal. The lungs are full of this, full of this white stuff. What's this white stuff? It could be. Uh, white blood cells, inflammatory cells, it could be fluid, it's just clearly abnormal. And since this was unexpected, um, the pulmonary doctors uh, were called to see this patient, and um, you know, the pulmonary doctors look at this patient carefully, they uh, review her history, they review her chest x-rays, and they suspect that this is due to fluid in her lungs um, from heart failure. And they recommend treating with diuretics. Um, which they think these water pills remove the fluid, and then she'll improve quickly. 
And so that's the recommendation, so that's what's done. The patient is given treatment for heart failure for five days. But five days later, she's not improving at all. And another chest x-ray is performed, and if anything, these abnormalities are worse. And at that point, her diagnosis was revised, and she was given the diagnosis of acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this is one of many examples of patients who are actually getting cared for in this healthcare system, and they're actually getting misdiagnosed, or they're diagnosed late, or they're um, <clears throat> not diagnosed at all. Um, and you know, there's one thing that's pr particularly problematic about this case for me. So as it turns out, the pulmonologist involved in this patient's care a few weeks ago was myself. So I am potentially, you know, an expert in the diagnosis of acute respiratory distress syndrome. And yet, even myself, I got confused with this case and, and potentially initially misdiagnosed the patient. So the problem that we're really talking about today is medical diagnosis. What's medical diagnosis? Medical diagnosis is the process of uncovering the condition or disease which is causing a patient's signs or symptoms. And it's really the fundamental or the critical first step to ensuring a patient gets the right treatment. And it's also an underappreciated source of quality of care, a quality of medical care. And diagnostic error is actually the most common cause of paid malpractice claims in the United States. And we're starting to recognize that medical diagnosis, inaccurate diagnosis, is really actually a problem that we should take seriously. And in fact, the Institute of Medicine converged a panel to think about this problem and think about ways of moving forward about the research that needs to be done to address the diagnosis of medicine in 2015. So today, I'm going to tell you about the consequences of in inadequate diagnosis of ARDS. And then I'm going to tell you about some of our work to develop models to identify patients with ARDS with the hope that these models that could, could be implemented at the bedside and help clinicians better identify patients with ARDS and treat them better. And, and so t in talking about these models, I'm going to tell you about some two concepts in machine learning, learning with label uncertainty and learning with privileged information. And then uh, if we have time, I'm going to discuss more briefly some of the other machine learning projects uh, that we're involved in in ARDS. So what's ARDS sort of for the non-clinicians in the room, which I, I suspect are most of the people here today? So acute respiratory distress syndrome is this um, severe inflammatory injury in the lungs, basically where the lungs get filled with white blood cells and fluid. And as a consequence of this, patients get very low oxygen levels. They need to be placed on mechanical ventilation or other invasive respiratory support. Um, they have a high mortality because of this. It, how ARDS developed, it's sort of a downstream consequence of a severe insult to the body like sepsis, pneumonia, trauma. And it's important that we recognize patients with ARDS when they develop this because we have like very specific intentional treatments that we can provide to these patients that can help to improve outcomes. The problem is that in clinical practice, we actually know that we do a very poor job of identifying cases of ARDS. So this is a major study in JAMA from 2016. And it basically followed patients with um, ARDS in 50 countries, 500 ICUs. And sort of the bottom lines from the study were that on the day that patients developed ARDS, they were only recognized as such 34% of the time, and 60% of patients were ultimately recognized at any point in their hospital stay. So this is a problem, and what's even more of a problem is when you look at whether or not these patients are getting treated appropriately. So this is a study that's looking at um, a particular treatment for ARDS called low tidal volume ventilation, and only 19% of patients in this study with ARDS were really adequately getting treated. And this is all because um, these clinicians were really failing to recognize and diagnose these patients appropriately. So what's going on here? Just kind of give you a better sense of why clinicians have so much trouble uh, diagnosing ARDS. So this is sort of what happens when a patient shows up to the hospital. So they show up, they have this really severe illness like sepsis or trauma or pneumonia. We gather a lot of data about this patient initially when they come in. We get vitals, we get laboratory values, um, 
You might have information from a waveform like an uh, EKG or a pulse oximeter. And we have all this information. We take this information. We sort of come up with a working diagnosis or a primary diagnosis which we treat the patient for. And some patients do better, but some patients do worse. And patients who end up developing an ARDS often don't develop this for, say, 12 to 24 to 48 hours after they present. So they, so they sort of evolve over time. And hopefully, at the right point, a, a astute clinician says, gosh, I need to get a chest x-ray. And then hopefully interprets the chest x-ray correctly and identifies these abnormalities and then puts it all together and makes a diagnosis of ARDS. And because of the sort of the temporal nature of this data um, and the challenge of sort of putting it all together, particularly given that you know, clinicians working in the hospital, particularly in the intensive care unit, have lots of other stuff going on, it's easy to miss. Another sort of issue with ARDS as a disease is that it's based on clinical criteria and the clinical criteria themselves have imperfect reliability. Um, so what does that mean? So if you ask um, two experts to review a case for ARDS, um, they, they kind of agree that the case is ARDS with a Kappa score of about 0.5. So what does that mean, just, just as a review? So Kappa is a measure of inter rater reliability. It's a score from 0 to 1, 1 sort of being perfect agreement, 0 being any agreement is no is what would be expected from chance alone. So a cap of 0.5, it's moderate, but it's really not that good. Why is that a problem? So when we can't identify the diagnosis of ARDS really well, it really hurts our ability to study this disease. So this is some simulation work that I've done in the past, sort of looking at whether when we, do, when we diagnose this condition ARDS with low reliability, um, can we actually study it well? Can we actually detect true association? So this is a simulation study looking at a biomarker association with the development of ARDS. If, if we diagnose ARDS really well with perfect reliability, we can detect that biomarker quite well. But um, as the reliability of the diagnosis worsens, we just fail um, to actually study this well and detect these true associations. And this problem is not just for epidemiologic or biomarker study. This problem is also um, um, a problem for clinical trials if we want to study new therapies. We can't identify these cases really reliably. We really are limited in our ability to study this disease. So um, the implications of low reliability diagnosis are it potentially is contributing to our inability to recognize these patients in practice and treat them. It's potentially an underappreciated source of bias and research, and it weakens our ability to um, really understand this disease better and learn new treatments for this disease. So what's the solution then? Um, well, our solution then is to develop um, data-driven approaches to ARDS identification. Our goal is to develop novel machine learning approaches to assist clinicians in identifying patients with ARDS. Um, as well as identify patients at high risk for developing the disease in the future. So I'm going to talk now and tell you more about some of the models that we've been de developing for ARDS. So, so for these models, our goal is to um, identify patients when they develop ARDS. So we're interested in using sort of all the data that's being collected on these patients from the time they come into the emergency room until the time where they develop this condition. So one of the immediate questions that um, we ask ourselves is, what should we do about the chest x-ray? So the chest x-ray is a critical piece of information. It's sort of critical to the overall diagnosis of ARDS. So should we have a model that includes information on the chest x-ray? Well, and when we thought about this, we said no. And the reason why is because if our model requires information from a chest x-ray, if the chest x-ray is not obtained in, in a live environment, the model may not run very well. So we don't want a model to be dependent on the chest x-ray information to make a good um, prediction or identification of ARDS. Um, and so our, our ideal model might actually uh, be able to use just routinely available data to actually identify patients that are at high risk for developing ARDS 
so that um, that algorithm potentially can tell a clinician, hey, this patient's high risk, maybe you should get a chest x-ray and, um, and confirm that diagnosis. So the basic problem formulation here is, you know, given a set of training examples where we have input features X and output labels Y, where Y is 1 if ARDS is present and Y is negative 1 if ARDS is absent, we want to find the function that maps X to Y. And so for this work, we use a data set of 401 patients. Uh, patients were admitted to the University of Michigan in January in 2016 with moderately low, low oxygen levels. There was also patients, additional patients admitted with respiratory failure. And this is sort of the data set in which we want to know whether or not they, the patient has ARDS. And for this work, we only pulled about 24 elect health, electronic health record variables, um, including some vital signs, laboratory values, and respiratory support settings. Um, and we did this a priori, sort of deciding that we wanted to pull uh, variables from the electronic health record, which we had at least some suspicion might be associated with the development of ARDS. Um, one sort of key question, how do you do this type of work? Um, well, we have to know which patients in our cohort actually developed ARDS. And this is actually not a trivial problem because um, there's no ICD-9 code to say, oh, the patient developed ARDS. It may not be well documented in the chart. So we actually have to ha have clinical experts review all the charts and um, look for themselves and sort of decide whether or not ARDS developed in this patient. And what's more, because I showed you data earlier that um, even, even among clinical experts, the reliability is only moderate. We actually need to have multiple people review the charts. And then the label is, the patient gets a label of ARDS if the majority of experts feel that the diagnosis is consistent with ARDS. So there's a lot of data that goes into uh, labeling a case. This is just sort of a screenshot of what you have to look at to sort of make the decision. You have to look at the electronic health record. You have to look at um, all the chest x-rays uh, that were performed on the patient. Uh, and then we created this survey tool, <clears throat> which uh, an expert clinician could use to review the chart and decide whether or not uh, ARDS was present. Um, and we basically asked them, um, based on your clinical judgment, did the patient develop ARDS during the first six days of the hospitalization, yes or no? Um, but then we also asked them, can you please provide the time in which you felt that ARDS developed? Because sort of a key question in these algorithms is we want to know not only did the patient develop ARDS, but also when they developed ARDS. So we had to build into the survey this question about what time over the course of the mission did they develop ARDS. And so the data looks something like this. So we have patients in the data set who are observed multiple times over the course of their admission. There might be a patient who initially shows up does not have ARDS and then develops ARDS later. A patient who shows up and is, has ARDS the whole time and then a patient who maybe is observed multiple times over the course of her admission and never develops ARDS. Um, and then this is our approach. Um, this is um, basically taking the data from the electronic health record, pre-processing it by normal, normalizing it, and then splitting the data at the patient level into two-thirds for training and a third for testing by patient. We use the training set to do cross-validation then we train the whole model on the training set, and then we apply the model to the test set, and we report results from the test set. And I just want to stop for a second and just mention that most of the results I'm about to show you were actually performed by Nick, um, a PhD student in Kayvon's lab. So, yeah, well done, Nick. So here's the initial results. Um, so we looked at a couple of classifiers, logistic regression, random forest and support vector machines. You know, and the results aren't great. Um, the uh, area under the receiver operating curve, uh, the sort of the best one is support vector machine. It's 0.71. It's not great. Um, um, and so I'm going to tell you, sort of spend the, mess of the, spend the rest of the time um, 
showing you how by extending these models we can get a, get a lot better. So um, because a lot of the talk today is about uh, extension to the support vector machine, I just want to make sure that everyone in the room is sort of on the same page about the general idea of a support vector machine, what's happening here. Um, so this is a depiction of the support vector machine. So um, basically, if you plot examples on sort, sort of two of their features, the goal of the support vector machine is to find um, a hyperplane or a decision boundary that separates positive and negative examples. And not only that, but it actually tries to find a decision boundary where that maximizes the distance between the decision boundary and um, the closest cases. So this is the so-called so maximal marginal classifier. But in reality, um, this isn't usually possible. It's very difficult. It's, it's unlikely that you're going to have a, a problem where the data is linearly separable. So you either choose to use a kernel or you choose to use or, or the combination of a kernel and um, this so-called soft margin SVM. So here, um, our goal remains to find the best decision boundary that classify or that separates the positive and negative examples. But for those cases in which we misclassify, we add this variable um, psi. Uh, this is a slack variable. And we try to minimize the distance between those, um, those uh, examples that are misclassified from the margin. And so that's what's sort of um, depicted here in this um, optimization algorithm, where we're trying to minimize w, which maximizes the margin of the uh, decision boundary while also min minimizing the slacks for those examples that we misclassify. And then the C parameter is the tuning parameter in which we um, <coughs> optimize during cross-validation. Um, one immediate problem with uh, support vector machines is that it can get a bit problematic when your data um, is super imbalanced. And our data is super imbalanced, so we have 13,000 negative examples and 700 positive examples. So that can sort of lead to a problematic decision boundary. Um, and the way that you can handle this is by performing something called class, uh, uh, support vector machines with a class weighted cost function. So the idea here is that, you know, if you have a bunch of uh, negative examples and not very many positive examples, you might, the, the decision boundary might be overly biased or, or overly influenced by all those additional negative examples. And it might lead to a boundary that doesn't perform as well. So um, then what we can do is we can um, weight the cost function so, such that we um, add a higher penalty to the misclassification of um, <clears throat> examples from the minority class. So that's what's happening here. Um, so we change the C parameter such that um, the minority class is weighted differently than the majority class. And sometimes this can lead to uh, better results. And so we did that, and we found that a support factor machine with a class weighted cost function sort of performed slightly better in terms of accuracy, but not a lot better in terms of the receiver area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. But then um, there's uh, a more sort of insidious and fundamental problem with uh, our problem or our data structure. So, um, you know, we have observations on patient over time, and we're using all these observations to train our algorithm. The problem is that these observations for a given patient aren't necessarily independent and identically distributed. Um, and, you know, IID is one of the assumptions of machine learning and having IID data ensures that we're going to be able to find the best classifier. And you know, in a lot of situations, this IID assumption is uh, kind of ignored. But we sort of suspected for this problem that, that this is going to be a problem, that if we are training our model with highly correlated data, it could sort of learn a model that overfits the training examples and not perform as well in testing. And so you can actually measure um, correlation between data points using this formula, which basically a, um, a measures the correlation between two vectors. And when we did this for the data, we found this interesting uh, result. So what I'm showing you here 
is that uh, is the average correlation within a patient's data over time. So for patients that um, or for examples that are really close together, you can see the correlation is quite high. Um, but then over time, um, as it, over time as you look at uh, examples or observations within a patient that are further away, the correlation sort of decreases. And so at some point, it seems like um, two, two observations on the same patient farther and farther away become close to IID. And so sort of with this intuition and this insight, um, we devise uh, a method or a sampling strategy to make the data look more IID. So the approach here is we basically start by sampling a data point on a patient sort of right at the beginning, and then we calculate the, uh, the correlation between that data point and all the rest of the data on the patient. And at some threshold eta um, we choose, we, we say, OK, after that threshold, the data is sort of not correlated as much anymore. So let's sample that data point, the first data point under that threshold eta. And then we basically start again. We um, start with that new data point, um, calculate correlation um, distance, and then uh, sample again under that threshold eta. How do you choose eta, this sampling threshold? Um, well, this is actually something that you could potentially cross-validate, and that's what we actually did. Uh, and so this is what the results look like. Um, so on the left side here is the difference in the accuracy between training and testing. And then the right side is uh, the validation uh, area under the receiver operating characteristic curve. And so this is what happens. So when you set the eta very high, um, what that means is you're sampling really highly correlated data. But then as the eta is lowered, the data becomes less correlated. And so as the data is uh, as the data is less correlated, the difference between training and testing accuracy decreases, suggesting that we're not overfitting the data as well. But then at some point, um, as the eta becomes too low, uh, this dis distance increases, and then our overall performance decreases too. So what's probably happening there? is that we're undersampling the data. And there's actually information in the data that we're losing by undersampling it. And so we're not actually getting as good a performance. And so we can actually find sort of the best sampling threshold eta in which we can use in this problem. And it's right around a correlation of 0.7. And so then when we do this, we actually have like quite a bit better performance across all the classification algorithms compared to not sampling at all. So this isn't necessarily a fair comparison either, because as it turns out, this correlation sampling strategy actually uh, substantially improves the imbalance in the data set. So now we're actually only using 1,100 negative examples and 700 positive examples, where with no sampling, we had substantially imbalanced data. So maybe a more fair comparison is um, actually doing a random sample such that the data remains uh, somewhat more balanced, uh, where we, we're randomly sampling so that um, there's twice as many negative uh, examples as positive examples. And you can see here um, that the correlation-based approach um, still works better. So that's all well and good, but um, <clears throat> You know, thinking about ARDS as a clinical problem and thinking about um, these clinical experts, potentially like myself, who are reviewing charts and sort of deciding, did a patient have ARDS or maybe they didn't have ARDS, you know, there really is a spectrum. There are some cases where we're just so confident, yes, this is clearly an ARDS case. We know this. The data looks like it. Their imaging looks like it. And then there's cases where yeah, it's not ARDS. We're really confident it's not ARDS. But then there's some, excuse me, there's some cases that we just don't know very well. That may be because the data is noisy, the, the image quality isn't very good, or we just don't know. And so maybe um, we can use this insight from a clinical expert on the confidence of a training level, label to better inform a model. So how did we do this? Basically, after we asked the expert, Based on your clinical judgment, did the patient develop ARDS? 
we immediately followed that by the question, how confident are you in your answer to your previous question with the following choices? Equivocal, slightly confident, moderately confident, or highly confident. And so now, when we're training with some information about the label uncertainty, we have training examples with features X and output class Y and a level of confidence on that training label. So how do we incorporate that into a support vector machine framework? It's actually fairly straightforward. Now we're adding a weighting Z um, to the slack variables, which is a additional penalty that's specific to each individual case, which is um, basically just um, <clears throat> taking the confidence on the label and transforming it um, such that the weighting becomes um, a, a, a number on a scale of zero to one. And so now, um, in our, um, <clears throat> in our, our um, support vector magazine optimization problem, we're, we're, we're weighting um, cases with lower certainty and higher certainty differently. So on the example here, this case, which we've misclassified, maybe uh, had low or, uh, lower certainty than this case, which had higher certainty. And so we place more emphasis on the cases with higher certainty, and we try to get these right. So when we do this, um, we actually do quite a bit better. Um, so when we account for the label uncertainty in the diagnosis, we actually um, do quite a bit better um, using both either the sort of the random sampling approach or the correlation-based sampling approach. And now we're getting uh, area under the operating curves of 0.855, which is actually uh, pretty good. <clears throat> so now I want to think uh, a little bit more about how we could potentially use these chest x-rays to train our model, even though we don't want the model to be dependent on the chest x-ray when it comes time to implement the model. So the idea here is that you know we have all this uh, we have all this training data and we have all these chest X-ray results and they must tell us something about the characteristic of the patient. So can we use that information to learn a better model, but then not have the model dependent on that information when it comes time for testing? And so that um, thinking about chest X-rays in that way is thinking about chest X-rays as privileged information. So what's this idea about privileged information? So um, in machine learning, in general, our goal is given a set of training examples, we want to find the function among a collection of functions that best approximate, a, approximates a decision rule. But in human learning, um, along with examples, um, we might have a teacher who sort of gives us some information explanation about the examples, some context, some comparisons, and we're able to learn um, with less examples quite effectively. This is particularly the case when it comes to training in clinical medicine. So, you know, be to become uh, a doctor, um, you may only see a few cases of a certain disease over the course of your training. Yet, you could still become fairly expert at managing these cases. And that's because while you're taking care of these patients during training, you have supervising physicians who are sort of guiding you and giving you insight into how to manage this case. You have, like, you have access to additional information as you're sort of learning about this case. And so in human learning, we don't need that many examples to do fairly well. And so that's the idea of privileged information in machine learning. So this is additional information that's um, <clears throat> available about the example at the time of training, but not at the time of testing. And this, there, it's actually the case that by using privileged information, you can reduce the number of samples you need to find the Bayes optimal solution, um, which basically means the best function from among those fun functions that we uh, potentially could choose from. Uh, and this is critical for scenarios where annotation of data is expensive. And that's clearly the case for ARDS and for lots of other problems, that asking all these clinical experts to annotate all this data takes time, it's expensive, so we'd rather not do that. So for, for me in particular, 
if, if this works well for ARDS, I like that because I don't have to spend so much time telling clinical experts to please go review these charts and tell me whether ARDS is present. Um, but I also would say that this type of privilege information, uh, it's available, I think, in a lot of other uh, situations in healthcare. This is just one example that I came up with off the top of my head. Um, say you wanted to um, <clears throat> train a classification algorithm to detect cells um, that were malignant or not in pathology slides. And so you may have the label provided by the pathologist, is it a malignancy or not? But you might also have sort of text information that sort of describes the slide that the pathologist is looking at. And maybe that text information might also um, give you insight onto why um, a, a certain group of cells is a malignancy or not. So now, um, in learning with privilege information, our formulation looks something like this. So we have features X still, but then we also have these privilege features called X star. And these features are available at training only. And then we have this output class Y still uh, that's negative one or one. So how do we handle um, uh, privilege information in a support vector machine framework? So now um, what we're doing is we're replacing the slack variable psi with a function of the privileged information. Uh, and the idea here is that this privileged information, again, provides us additional insight as to whether or not it's OK uh, or is it more or less OK that one of our examples we misclassify. And so in solving this optimization problem, however, we have to learn the feature weights uh, <clears throat> and, and additional feature weights uh, uh, for, the, for the privilege information uh, on this function in addition to all these other um, values. And so when we did this, oh, I'm going to tell you one other thing before I tell you that. So um, in the optimization problem of support factor machine for privilege information, um, the decision rule for new values of x, including the dual form of the decision rule, still doesn't require x star. So this is a reminder again. So when you do a support vector machine um, optimization problem, you end up with a function. And when you put a new, uh, a new data x to that, into that function, the classification rule um, <clears throat> is positive or negative based on the sign of that function. And so um, the dual formulation of this problem um, where you basically um, um, <clears throat> you um, take this new information in, in um, it's a linear combination of the support vectors of the decision function um, you can see still that you don't need um, x star um, after you learn the best optimization function you learn the right support vectors you still don't need this information this privileged information to make um, a decision or a prediction about a new case. So how does this perform? Um, well, you know, again, it performs pretty good, at least compared to the SVM without privileged information. So this is preliminary work that we did um, as part of uh, the uh, NSF application, where we can again see that um, incorporating this additional information is a problem that we have available at training time only allows us to do a lot better in terms of the performance of the algorithm. So um, I'd like to just sort of um, lead you with this idea that um, learning with uncertainty and with privileged information, I think, um, is um, relevant to a lot of different medical problems. Because um, there's actually a lot of medical conditions that have some degree of diagnostic uncertainty. And I think people outside of medicine may not appreciate that you know, there's, there's some uncertainty in diagnosis um, uh, for lots of conditions. And, and then I would also say that there's a lots of privileged information available in electronic health record data that might be leveraged to improve uh, the training of a model. So just as an example, um, sepsis is an important clinical problem in medicine right now, right? It's a severe infection that causes high mortality, lots of bad outcomes. And um, <clears throat> 
uh, sepsis has pretty, pr pretty imperfect precision in the diagnosis, yet there's still a need to um, identify patients with sepsis in real time. Um, um, and then at the same time, um, there's data that's important for making the diagnosis of sepsis that may not be available. So when a patient comes in with sepsis, we often draw blood cultures, and um, those culture results aren't going to be available maybe for 24 to 48 hours. So we can't rely on the culture result to make a decision about whether or not a patient has sepsis. But at the same time, um, in retrospective data that we use to train an algorithm, we actually have those cultural results, right? We will actually know which patients had cultures that were positive or negative. And potentially, that's privileged information that we could, again, use to improve the performance of our algorithm. So now that I've talked about that in more detail, I just want to mention some of the other projects uh, that we're currently working on in machine learning and image processing in ARDS. Um, so, in addition to identifying patients at the time of ARDS onset, uh, we're also working on identifying patients who are at high risk for developing ARDS um, and um, using the data based pretty much when they show up to the hospital to predict whether they're going to develop ARDS in the future. Uh, and this is an important clinical problem because we're actually quite interested in just determining whether or not among these high risk patients we can do things to prevent ARDS from developing. Uh, and this work is supported by a MIDAS challenge grant. Um, so the data that we're using here is patients um, January through March 2016. Uh, and we're pulling out for this project 60 variables from the electronic health record, labs, vitals, medications. And in this case, we're able to generate almost 900 features from these variables. And um, we're using a, a L2 logistic regression model to make predictions about whether or not a patient's going to develop ARDS in the future. So these are our preliminary results for this work. Um, as you can see, our baseline electronic health record model um, uh, performs pretty well, and it performs a lot better than LIPS, which is this lung injury prevention score, um, which is sort of like the state of the art for, um, <clears throat> for, the, for prediction of whether a patient's going to develop ARDS. And the other thing that's exciting about this model is all this data is pulled automatically from the electronic health record. So we can actually make multiple predictions over time again to um, make predictions about whether or not a patient's going to develop ARDS in the future. Because we may not have all the information immediately available when they come in. These patients may maybe progress, and then they become high risk at some future time point. And uh, we're excited about this work. And our plans are to think about some different formulations um, thinking about incorporating time varying parameters with a uh, long short term memory network framework, and then thinking about um, using unsupervised learning to learn better feature representations of the data before making predictions. The other thing that we're working on right now, again, something that Nick is leading, um, is uh, image processing to detect chest x rays that are consistent with ARDS. Um, and I didn't tell you much detail about this before, but when we looked at why clinicians disagree about the diagnosis of ARDS, it's mainly driven by disagreement in chest x-rays. And so the question is, um, can we develop image processing machine learning algorithms to quantify lung injury and help identify chest x-rays that might be consistent with ARDS? So this is kind of a cool problem. Um, and there's really two main steps in this problem. The first step is segmenting a chest x-ray to identify lung windows or the lung regions, so those are the regions of interest. And if you have a chest x-ray that's performed on an outpatient setting, a chest x-ray like this one, it's actually not that hard to do this to identify the lung regions. Um, and this, this, this work was, or this uh, identification was using the random walker algorithm, which is one of many uh, algorithms that, which you can use. Um, but the problem is, in the ICU, the chest x-rays are a lot harder um, because they often have lots of other stuff. Um, they might have EKG leads. They might have other wires. And some of these simpler algorithms um, don't necessarily work as well for identifying lung regions. So the approach that we're using here is using an algorithm first. It's called um, total variation denoising. 
what's happening there. So the idea is that when you have a lot of detail in an image, like very, very high detail, some of that detail may, might actually be noise and it might be unnecessary. And so um, by using the t total variation denoising algorithm, what we can do is potentially remove some of these like high detailed structures that potentially are, are just getting in the way, but preserve sort of the main underlying detail of the image and then do that first and then use one of these algorithms um, to detect the lung um, borders. Uh, in addition to segmentation, we have to do some work in uh, feature uh, extraction where we're actually extracting features from the lung that identify these cloudy patterns that might be consistent with lung injury. Uh, and so here, this is, um, it's called a Hessian-based blur detection algorithm, something that Harm Dirksen uh, collaborated in the lab is sort of developing. Um, and um, <clears throat> in using this algorithm and some other algorithms, um, we can identify sort of areas of these images that um, are abnormal and use these as features um, in a classification algorithm to uh, detect uh, images consistent with ARDS. So this is still preliminary work. We hope in the future to be able to share exciting results on the output of this work. So um, I'm going to leave you uh, at this point with just a few uh, conclusions, and then I think there'll be time for questions. So uh, I hope I've showed you today that uh, machine learning approaches can offer pretty exciting solutions to the problem of ARDS diagnosis. And then I hope I also sort of shared with you how uncertainty in the labels and potentially privileged information is common in healthcare settings. And we, it might be important to consider that when we're building machine learning applications in healthcare. And then finally, I just want to let you guys know that there's really an urgent need to improve accuracy of diagnosis in healthcare. I mean, this is a real problem. Uh, it's beginning to become more and more appreciated. And I really think that sort of broadly, data science can really offer exciting solutions to this problem of improving diagnosis. So lots to people to thank that made this work all possible. Of course, Kayvon is an outstanding mentor and collaborator, and the people in Kayvon's lab, including Nick and then Oscar, who recently joined, have been super helpful. I have great mentorship, and I work with cool people, including Jenna Weens and Brahmajana Nalamathru, and some undergraduate students in electrical engineering. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. In AR, they ask, so if you wrongly diagnose them with that, like what happens to the patient? Is it like a, because depending on that, if it's not a big problem to misdiagnose them, you could adjust your slack function to weight more heavily on correctly getting, so get more like increase a little bit to the false positives, yeah. but get more. Totally. Yeah so. yeah, so it depends on what we decide to do next. Um, there are certain interventions that we might give to patients with ARDS that are sort of low risk. We could probably get away with giving them to everyone. In fact, often we do, simply because we're not good at diagnosing ARDS. And there's other interventions that are much higher risk, like potentially literally paralyzing the patient so they cannot move so we completely control their breathing function, or turning them over, or doing some of these other sort of, presumably at this point, only experimental therapies that are high risk. So it's likely that um, we might have to, if we wanted an algorithm, to adjust the cost function depending on that situation. Because certainly there's, there's lower cost to getting false positives in certain situations, but there's much higher cost in others. Yes. Um, have you considered, have you tried ensembling? I notice you use a lot of single models. Yes, um, we have not tried ensembling. Um, that seems like um, a reasonable idea. Because we were sort of wanting to develop these um, new, new methodologic approaches, we're sort of focusing on a single model. I think ultimately the idea is that we'll, we'll try to incorporate um, 
privileged learning or living with uncertainty in all these classification algorithms, um, and then potentially we could use them as an ensemble. Yes. Um, so the the 24 features that you use for prediction, yeah. were did the clinicians see those features when they scored the cases? It's hard to know, probably not. Um, so those 24 features are like labs and vital signs. I mean, they could have gone to the chart and saw all those features, but it's unlikely. They probably just reviewed some of the notes. They looked at the images and sort of got an overall gestalt, 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 gestalt of the case. Gestalt. Yeah, 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 <laughs> gestalt. And then, so, so I'm not sure, but I doubt they were influenced very heavily by them. And then they didn't have perfect agreement with each other. They did not. So whatever that kappa is should be a ceiling on the, uh, so I don't actually know exactly how a, a kappa and an area under the curve of an ROC should equate, but there should be some ceiling. I mean, your, 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 yeah. your, your machine learning, one would think, wouldn't be able to do better than any individual scorer. Well, I mean, that's something that we're interested in. So. So when we use three clinicians, um, so an in, uh, individual clinician's cap is 0.5. Um, we can actually determine what uh, cap it is for a group of clinicians. And for our work, it's about, I think, 0.85, 0.8-ish. So by, by combining a group of clinicians, we have a higher reliability as a group. But your point is well taken. Um, so there's other, other ways that we could sort of evaluate. We could see if our model is equivalent to any individual clinicians among the group, or if our model is better than any individual clinician. This issue is coming up now because um, you know um, we're using groups of imperfect clinicians to build a gold standard uh, in building for building algorithms. Um, so there are ways of looking at this, and you're right. Um, you know, um, but the hope is that our model can sort of replicate the group understanding of multiple clinicians, and then perhaps be better to, than any individual. Yeah. yeah. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, sure. You know, I, I want to follow on with this a little bit. Yes. My question was really related, I think, and it has to do with, you know, various communities and how they trust this stuff, and whether, you know, you see, are we going to have to have national standards? Yes. I mean, you know, we <laughs> often talk about the FDA, and these yes. things would be advice, you know, kind of devices, but, you know, it's like, what, what a clinician, you know, we have some examples, you know, they're not really all that good. I mean, you know, from the point of view of, you know, anatomic pathology, you know, machines can score slides, you know, maybe better than pathologists, but the anatomic pathologist might it back. Uh, radiologists, you know, I mean, finding yeah. little nodules. I mean, what do we have to do to convince the physician to have trust in this kind yeah. of stuff? Yeah, so uh, there's a few things. I think... Um, they just have to get used to it. Um, and no, I mean, seriously. And so, like, I think, frankly, that, you know, medical students who are training now as compared to current practicing physicians are going to generally be more comfortable with this idea. I think over time, as they use it in practice and they recognize that the model works really well, um, they're going to become more comfortable with it. I think sort of a key thing. Um, that you know people are working about working on right now is sort of comprehension or understandability of models. So that's a key piece and how to display that to a physician so they sort of understand how the model is getting to a particular um, decision is sort of going to be important because you know then the, the, the clinician can, can know if in the given situation that he's in right now can um, is the model appropriate, can it be applied to that situation? And then I think it's sort of like like if it makes clinicians' life easier, like that's really going to be a thing. Like, like ultimately, if a pathologist doesn't have to look at every single cell on a slide, if they only have to look at you know a third of the cells because uh, an algorithm screened the first two thirds, you know, I think like that's better, um, and I think uh, clinicians would like it. Or, for example. Um, um, you know, if you're reading cardiac MRIs and the algorithm can calculate the ejection fraction for you so you don't have to, like, take the time to do that, I mean, I think, I think the clinicians will like that. Um, but this is sort of, 
an inherent problem, and I don't think like we're gonna we're gonna be successful if all we give them is black boxes. From my experience as a clinician, I don't and I don't and I think you're right. I mean, I think the FDA, FDA is gonna have to demand um, that there's some sort of way to look inside the black box so we can understand how the model is generating a decision. And yeah. Brian, I also wonder how much this is why it's interesting to do this at the University of Michigan rather than somewhere else, right? Part of what you're needing to do, right, is you drive the money. Part of why the pathologists are hesitant to not look at the slides is right now they get paid 100 bucks to look oh, at the slides. Oh, I get slide. that. <laughs> it turns out once we stop paying them to do a cell count, yeah, they were really comfortable all change. of a sudden with how the culture <laughs> counter could just count those cells just fine. Right, and part of what Mike's doing that's so interesting is dealing in places where the human beings who do this are too slow yeah, to okay. do this, Especially right? These Mike needs this cases, stuff at three yeah. in the morning. Yeah. The radiologists aren't there at three in the morning. Right. So Thanks, yeah, Jack. I think we're yeah. making. No, I, absolutely. I, yeah, I think we're making. We're, our hope is to make lives easier and actually um, focus the clinicians um, so they spend their effort on the things that they do best, right? Like. Presumably interacting with patients, helping patients make decisions, and, and leave some of these sort of more technical stuff to a model. Well, yeah. I think one thing that we should think about, and you know, when Dr. Sao was here with the Institute of Medicine and gave his talk, and we've had several talks at the health system level, but it's a national problem, is uh, physician burnout. Yeah. You know, and this could really help. You know, especially into the intensive care unit settings and things like that. Where in, in addition to the burnout, we're seeing uh, one one um, piece of data that was fascinating was 27 percent of the physicians in the ICUs are suffering from PTSD, mm. and that's I was told that that was really an underestimate. And so uh, you know, in these high stress situations, you know, having these kinds of tools that we could rely on, you know, could really help with this. And you know, I think we should be thinking about this because physician burnout is really a national problem. Yeah. I also think, like, pretty soon we're going to have to think about medical curriculum changes such yeah. that we actually train physicians to think about these things and learn how to use these things. Because, um, you know, the sort of the curriculum that I was exposed to as a medical student on sensitivity and specificity and all these other sort of diagnostic test evaluation tools was pretty poor. So this is, this is a new era, and so physician training is going to have to change. Thank you again, Dr. Schroeding, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. I understand.